I'm Sydney Stringham, 19, 21, 23, Director of Alumni Engagement. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Before we can get this party started, a few ground rules. This will be recorded, so anyone that wants to watch it later on can. If you have any questions throughout, you can pop them in the Q&A. We'll answer those at the end. And I'd like to introduce our Vice President of Institutional Advancement and Alumni Engagement, Paula Lee Hobson. Paula Lee. Thank you, Sydney. Good evening, everybody. I have a brief PowerPoint presentation to share with everyone. Uh, first, to uh, introduce myself uh, briefly. Uh, this is my 25th year in higher education advancement and alumni engagement. I was a low-income, first-generation kid from a very, very small rural hometown, and I was able to attend the University of Oregon on a full-ride uh, donor-funded scholarship, which is one of the reasons I do this work. Uh, prior to my time in higher education, um, I have led three major campaigns in higher ed. Prior to that, I was at 15 years in private industry working with engineers, architects, and scientists. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to thank all of you who participated in Elmira Everlasting on Wednesday, April 24th. We had a new program out called Thank a Giver. So thank you to Chuck and First Lady Jan and Lindsay. They went with the mascots and we took pictures of all the signs on campus to share with donors who have made such a difference and really invested in the college. Uh, thanks to generous donors, we set a record of $165,170 this year. Our goal was $100,000. We started out and blew by that uh, in the early afternoon on the 24th, so we increased it to 125 and uh, we ended at 165 with 590 gifts. If you have not yet made a gift, it's not too late. You can certainly send in a check or make a gift online and restrict it for Elmira Everlasting. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you some updates. I was asked by the alumni board. I thought this might be something that would be helpful to people. They asked, okay, well, I make my annual fund an unrestricted gift every year, but I really don't know what it goes toward. So this list is from Kyle Gilbert, our vice president of finance. This is what was actually spent out of that fund in fiscal years 21, 22, and 23, the current year, which is fiscal year 24, and what we propose to do it next year in 25. So you'll see the wide range of things that support academics, areas with professorships and hiring new faculty, some of our capital improvement projects, uh, new upgraded software, campus events, and so on. So I just wanted to give you a sensibility of how we use the money that you so generously provide. Next slide, please. I was also asked about the amount of dollars that we award in scholarships. I'm very proud of these two numbers. You'll see uh, the current year, academic year 23-24, a little over 12.8 million. 100% of our new full-time undergraduate students receive a merit scholarship and 97% of all undergraduate uh, students receive their merit scholarship. So this is where we spend our scholarship money. Um, thanks, Jen, go ahead. So I'm announcing tonight uh, for the first time publicly our uh, alumni mentoring program that we are going to launch a pilot of in fall of 24. Uh, we did some focus group testing with students. So thank you to Dr. Allison Wolf who helped us with that uh, brand research. And Jen's team came up with this beautiful design. It's under wing. So again, we're soaring Ingalls. So the alumni mentoring program under wing uh, mentoring program begins in fall. Next slide, please. So I wanted to explain what why we're doing it. Obviously, for the, in the short term, we want our students to have real-time career mentoring and opportunities for them to really connect with the alumni network and understand the value proposition. Secondly, we want alumni to be more deeply involved in the current work of the college. And it's a pretty easy, uh, small way to accomplish volunteer roles that are high touch, high engagement. So it's it, it isn't just activity, though, for its own sake, not just for simply for engagement. All the research shows that an engaged alumnus or alumna is more likely to be philanthropic throughout their entire lifetime. The long, the long term side, we obviously want to improve our student retention and graduation rates while increasing alumni engagement and philanthropic support. So next slide, please. So what does it look like? So in the fall of 24, we're going to recruit 25 students. We already have recruited two students. Uh, Jax Graham, class of 26, actually works in my department and said, when I asked her what her interest was in her career, she said, well, don't laugh at me. 
And I said, I won't laugh at you. And she said, I'm interested in working for the FBI. She said, you probably don't have an alumni mentor. And I said, oh, yes, I do. So Chad Thorley, class of Vought two, on our, our board of trustees. And she connected, I've also been able to connect uh, one of our wonderful women's ice hockey players, Holly Riva, class of 23, with two special education teachers. So the idea then is to match the alumni in those fields for the career-related exploration with things like informational interviews, job shadowing, career coaching, internship site hosts, small group industry presentations, and even entry-level jobs. Someone asked me the other day what an informational interview is. So I did one with one of our other students personally, and I said, how do you get to be a vice president of development? You started out as a pre-med major, and then you switched to English, and then you added marketing. You know, how did your career path wander to this place? And so it's really just talking about the skill sets that I use every day. Um, and then in terms of who we are most interested in, we're going to focus on our juniors and seniors because we want to get them ready for those first job interviews uh, in the fall. So we're looking at current sophomores who will be then what's known as rising juniors. So they will be a junior in the fall and rising seniors. Uh, and the notion there is that if a senior is not matched in the fall, for whatever reason, they would be given first right of refusal in spring of 2025. If all goes well, I've done this program at two other institutions, we will continue to double the number of matches. I'm very proud to say that right now we have 88 alumni who've raised their hands to offer to be an alumni mentor. So I'm really confident we're going to have more than enough to match the 25 we have in the fall and hopefully the 50 that we will have in spring. Um, I would be happy to take any questions now or at the end of the program. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to meet you, at least electronically. Holly, it is now my pleasure to introduce President Chuck Lindsay for a small update and to introduce our guest of honor. Thank you, Sydney. And thanks very much, Paula Lee, for announcing that program. Sounds very exciting. I have a couple of other things that I will share about this year, which I think has been a great one for Elmira College. First, you may know that this past fall, we introduced our Take Flight initiative, where we offer a, a full tuition scholarship to students who are from lower income families. And it's really about providing New York State residents with access to an Elmira College education. And we've been very successful with that program. It's gotten a lot of traction. Uh, it, we have 31 students who've made a deposit so far uh, that have qualified for the free tuition at Elmira College. And it looks like it's also attracted some other students, uh, an, an additional 26 who uh, still needed some financial assistance, didn't qualify for the program, but they liked what they saw and they decided they wanted to enroll at Elmira College. So we're gratified about that. You may have also heard that we are breaking ground for a on an artificial turf field on campus, on the main campus, so we can bring a lot of athletic activity uh, to campus and make things a lot more lively and engaged rather than having everyone drive up to the domes for each athletic competition. Uh, we, we, we will be breaking ground in just about two weeks and we will have that field up and running in the fall. So stay tuned for some more information about that. And the last thing I'll say is that you're probably aware students are very into more professional type majors in programs these days. And we have reshaped our curriculum to meet that need. So while we still have the strong underpinning in the liberal arts to make sure that people have those fundamental skills, we've this year offered, uh, introduced programs, uh, a BS in social work, which is new for us. It'll be launched next year. Business concentrations in esports and gaming administration and digital marketing. And there's some new concentrations in criminal justice, including cybersecurity, pre-law and corrections and a bachelor of science in forensic science. So some pretty interesting and tantalizing areas. So now it's my pleasure to get to the main event for tonight. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Sheila Williams class of 78 to you. This is 
another in a series of presentations by notable alumni, and we're gratified that Sheila's spending some time with us this evening. Uh, she's a multiple Hugo Award-winning editor of Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine and the winner of the 2017 Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award for Distinguished Contributions to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Community. Uh, she started at Asimov's in June of 1982 as an editorial assistant, and over the years has promoted, was promoted to different editorial positions at the magazine. She also served as the executive editor of Analog from 1998 until 2004 with Rick Wilbur. She's also the co-founder of Dell Magazine's Award for Undergraduate Excellence in Science Fiction and Fantasy. And this annual award has been bestowed on the best short story by an undergraduate student at the International Conference on the Fantastic since 1994. In addition, she's an editor and co-editor of 26 anthologies. Her newest anthology, Entanglements, Tomorrow's Lovers, Families, and Friends, was published as part of the MIT Press 12 Tomorrow series. So, Sheila, we're grateful to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Um, it's uh, not really on the full screen. Am I on the full screen? <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I um, I have been uh, I I've been in as in publishing since 1982, so it's been my lifetime career. But I feel I owe a lot of my career to my experiences at Elmira. I. Um, had never even heard of Elmira College when I was in high school. I was very quiet. I was very shy. I was always very, very interested in science fiction. I had actually formed a science fiction club in high school, but I was really, really shy. I really didn't know how to talk to people. And the, the, only, college, the only school I was very aware of was, called, was the University of Kansas because there was a professor there named James Dunn who was offering science fiction courses. But um, and this was back before the Common App and before easy, you know, typing. I didn't have a, there was also a thing as a family computer. So um, we did all our applications for college were handwritten and arduous. And um, so I only applied to a few schools. And I, my guidance counselor had recommended Elmira to my father and I at a meeting. It sounded wonderful, but so I was very happy I got into both Elmira and KU, and I didn't know which school to go to, and my father was worried. He said, you could get into KU, but you're so shy, you could be really lost at a large university, and who knows, you might not even get into the science fiction class, and I'd known people who hadn't got into courses, so I decided to listen to my father, and we both had thought, we had visited Elmira, we thought it was gorgeous, we loved the um, whole emphasis on Mark Twain never letting education um, learning interfere with his education. We thought the whole everything about Elmira looked great, so I decided to go to Elmira. Um, arrived at Elmira again, a very shy freshman, um, and I had applied. There was a we had a certain courses we had to take, and then I had applied to take Intro to Philosophy, and I didn't get into the class, <laughs> so I was sitting in a little cafeteria in the student center. Um, and what I did notice in the book was that I could reapply to the night class. It was a three hour night class in Intro to Philosophy. So I decided to do that. I also made another decision. I thought, well, nobody at this school knows me. They don't know I'm really shy. I'm gonna walk out of here and I'm gonna start saying, smiling and saying hello to everyone I meet first. So I did both those things. And they both really, those, those two decisions, I think, changed the direction of my life. Um, the first was that I ended up in the night class in, Elmer, uh, in philosophy. My professor was John McLaughlin. I ended up taking every course he offered and becoming and taking political science classes and comparative religion classes and everything because of my he be, really became a mentor for me, and I, we're still good friends. We still communicate. We still write letters to each other. 
Um, at the same time, my dad had been right. Elmira was a great place for me to make new friends. I was at Columbia Hall the first year. I had a great floor with wonderful people that are still my friends today. And um, and really ha had that blossoming experience that my father had predicted for me. Um, at Elmira, in addition to the academics, I was able to take advantage of a lot of um, sort of, you know, the other aspects of college. So. I worked on the school newspaper, and because I worked on the school newspaper, I actually was able to interview Gene Roddenberry, who was the um, founder, you know, created Star Trek. Um, can't imagine any other chance I, time I would have had that opportunity. I, um, I worked at a local newspaper. My, the semester I had to do, uh, that I did an internship, I interned at a local newspaper, and they were lovely, and that was a great experience for me. And um, uh, I was able to apply my junior year to the London School of Economics, which um, I didn't actually realize how difficult it was to get into at the time. Um, but the two, there were two of us from Elmira who applied, myself and another student named Steve Glick, and we both got in. And we found ourselves in London. At the first day, they had a big meeting of all the um, the nice thing about the LSE was they threw you right in with all the other students as if you were a, a, a regular undergraduate. And the full name of the school is London School of Economics and Political Science. So it was a heavy emphasis on philosophy of political science as well as economics. But the first day they said, we hope you 70 students realize that for every one of you that's here, we've rejected you know, loads of other people. We had 14 applicants from Cornell and we only took two of them and, and I sat there I actually what and I went up to them afterward I said really and he's I said you took the two from Elmira and you only took two from Cornell and he said we didn't want everyone coming from the same school so I was very grateful that I had applied from Elmira and I had the most marvelous year at um, the London School of Economics I returned to um, Elmira and um, not that I knew at the moment that this was significant, but it turned out a new magazine had just had launched in the spring of 1977. And I had missed this launch because I'd been in England. So I didn't see this magazine till the fall of 1977. So this was the third issue. And um, uh, Jen, if you want to you can put up the slide, um, this was the the first issue I saw of Asimov Science Fiction Magazine. And the first three issues had Isaac Asimov's face on the cover. Everyone started from a different viewpoint. There's a big joke. Were they going to show the back of his head for the fourth? But they moved away to regular art. So this was my, I found this in the bookstore at Elmira College. And I was so excited. I knew about science fiction magazines uh, growing up from Isaac Asimov's own book, the Hugo winners, which in his introductions, he talked about, and his own biography, he talked about his father having a candy store and him reading, finding science fiction magazines in the store and reading them. So I was, you know, I found this magazine. I really enjoyed it. It never occurred to me at the time, of course, that I'd end up working there. Um, and you can take the slide down now if you want. Um, so I, um, I finished up at Elmira at, toward the, in the spring of my senior year. I was um, the office of uh, the career in office told me about um, a one day workshop in New York City where I could go and find out about magazine publishing. And fortunately, I had an aunt who lived on Long Island. I was able to, to drive down and take advantage of that. But I also had applied to a number of um, graduate schools in philosophy. And I got a full scholarship to Washington University in St. Louis, so I decided to go there to pursue a master's or a PhD in philosophy. And I was there a couple of, about two years, but I realized it really wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. Nowadays, I tell people those, that was my gap year, gap years. And, um, and it was great, but I decided that a friend of mine said, if you could do anything, in the, what would you do? And I said, I'd go to New York and I'd get a job at a science fiction magazine. I would switch my vocation and my avocation because I could always read philosophy in my spare time just as easily as I could read science fiction while I was studying. So 
my good friend had moved to New York and she was getting a, a master's of social work at Columbia. And she let me stay with her for a little while while I was looking for work. And then, you know, I found one job, but then I found another. And eventually I was able to find an opening at, um, at a company called Davis Publications that published Asimov's and Analog Science Fiction magazines. It was a while before I, um, I was actually, um, I was about six months and then an opening came up on the magazine and they knew that I really love science fiction. So I was, I was offered the editorial assistant position and, um, and that was great. So at Asimov, so I started off at the very lowest level you could imagine doing all the, you know, filing, typing, that was before computers again. So I had to type letters for the editor and, um, really doing all the basic work. Um, Anyways, um, and uh, so I moved from, so eventually the, that editor left fairly soon and I actually, my duties really increased. And I, one thing, and I, um, it was very exciting work and it was during the early years that uh, like this issue here on the cover right now up on your screen is the June 1984 issue which we published Octavia Butler's Blood Child, which went on to win the Hugo. And of course, Octavia is super famous, has became super famous and well-known author, but at that time she really wasn't that well-known. I think this was her first major award. And I got to sit next to her at the Hugo ceremony, which was one of the highlights of my life too. Um, over in uh, skipping ahead in, uh, well, I will go back to it a little before I skip ahead. One of the great joys, and we can take this screen, this off the screen if you want, and just have me on if you want for a little bit. Um, I worked with uh, Isaac Asma for 10 years, and that was just a truly amazing experience. He was a wonderful human being, and we really became good friends, and eventually I actually spoke at his funeral, and, uh, you know, it was very, it was really, he was as funny and, um, and uh, as interested in person as he was a public speaker. He was an amazing public speaker, but he was a great friend. And so uh, he died in 1992. And just before he, or died actually a few months before he died, the magazine was sold to a big um, multi, well, a big conglomeration. It's actually owned by a, a German family, but it's a big, uh, called Bertelsmann. And they owned a number of publishing houses at that time. They owned Phantom, Doubleday, Dell. In later years, they they now actually also own Random House, but they didn't at that time. So, um, so we were there. I luckily went with the sale. Um, all the fiction editors went with the sale, so we held on to our jobs. It was a little bit scary, um, but I worked with there for four years and um, it's about, I would say toward, we, we were one of the, um, so we were a continue, I had, we had, I had a couple of editors had come and gone. I was, um, I was working, I had worked with Shauna McCarthy and then I worked with Dargo Desois and he was the editor from, um, so Shauna published Octavia Butler in 84, Gardner became the editor in about 86 or 87. And uh, he was there for about 19 years as the editor. So we worked with people like um, George R. R. Martin, Connie Willis, and one of our big claims to fame was we were actually the first, we published the very first um, piece of Game of Thrones. Um, and in fact, the only part of, George has won other Hugo and Nebula Awards, but the only one part of his Game of Thrones that won a Hugo was this novella, Blood of the Dragon, uh, which came out in July 1996. The book came out about a month later in August. So this was an excerpt from the book. And of course, it was a huge hit. But people didn't know it was going to be the huge hit that it became. Um, we went on in December 2000. We published another cover, of another story by George. I have another cover here that you can see, um, which was also from the same series. 
path of the dragon, the second from the next book in the series. Um, and uh, so we can, and then you can take this the covers off again. Thanks. So I worked with many, many well-known people, and I was promoted by every. Um, I had a great career already going. My everyone, I in in '96, we were sold to another publishing house, a smaller publishing house that was known more for game magazines like um, Crossword Puzzle and Word Search, which is called, well, Penny Press and also Dell magazines. We all and. Uh, uh, but but we were sort of they had us as their four. We, they also we were part of a, a four a group that included two mystery magazines. So they bought us part of. We came with the sale with the puzzle magazines, and we became their little fiction uh, quartet. And um, and so it was kind of back to a smaller publishing house again, which is what I had started with. And um, they so I became along the way. I think. I don't remember whether it's, but under one of those publishers, it became the executive editor, which made, meant that I was in charge of all the staff at both science fiction magazines, not the editors, but hiring editorial assistants and uh, internships and anything else along the way. And I was given a lot of responsibility, but I still wasn't the acquiring editor, but I was really enjoying my job. The nice thing about the job when I wasn't the acquiring editor is that I read all the great stories that we were buying. So I never actually had to read stories where I had to make up my mind about what to buy. So um, finally, though, in um, 2004, the editor was retiring, and I was offered the position to be the editor-in-chief, the acquiring editor, which is a dream that, you know, 16-year-old Sheila or Sheila, college freshman Sheila would never have imagined it would work out, but it, you know, it had happened. So became the editor in chief, and you can show I have a slide of my very first issue. Um, this is by the artist Michael Whalen, who is considered one of the best illustrators ever of, of science fiction and fantasy art. He did a lot of famous um, rock albums as well, and. Uh, wonderful artist, and uh, Connie Willis is one of the best authors we've ever published, and I actually got to publish a little reprint article and work with Roger Ebert for this issue. They told me as long as I didn't say, his lawyer said, as long as you don't say that Roger Ebert gives you a thumbs up. I said, well, I hadn't even thought of that, but he had been a science fiction fan as a teenager, and he had written something that we were reprinting, and I did tell his, his lawyer, who acted as his agent, that I was cutting about a thousand words from his piece. The agent said, oh my God, how can you do that to Roger Ebert? And I said, well, it's all this stream of consciousness poetry. And then the lawyer who had this very deep voice said, oh, you mean the kind of poetry we were writing when we were in college together? And I said, yes. He said, oh, I think Roger will thank you. That's okay. So that was fun. So this is my very first issue. I'm very, very proud of this issue. And you can take the slide down. Um, so I went on, I, I, it's been, in, it was incredible to finally be the editor of the magazine. I loved working with all the authors all along. And the great thing about my job is I always traveled. I went to conventions. I met all the authors. I worked with them as the, as the managing editor of the magazine, as the associate editor. I worked on all their stories. I edited them and I had a great relationship. I worked with those who we worked with. You know, I worked with everybody. But there is something different about actually being the acquiring editor and purchasing the stories and really shaping the issue to be what you want. It becomes a, it became my, I felt every issue was like my little art object, curating each story, that, choosing each story that went into it and putting them all together like a puzzle to make, because there are many things you choose when you build a magazine, the length of stories that you have to work with each other. You don't want too many sad stories. You want a couple of funny stories. You don't want to have, um, you can't have all time travel stories. You want to have some alter, an alternate history or a, um, um, you know, you want some hard science fiction or you might want to have some space travel. You might have some alien, but you can't have them all. Be, they have to be different. You can have that very weird, strange, obscure story that no one really they would think if it was published in New York that the person was having a nervous breakdown, but if it's published in Asimov, it's really happening. So, but you want to mix it up. You can't have every story be the same. So it was great to be my magazine with my choices. 
And one of the most exciting things I got to do, and I'm still going, still editing, but uh, James Gunn, the author I mentioned, who was a professor at Kansas University of Kansas, lived to be 95 years old. He only died a, a couple of years ago. And I eventually became his editor. I bought a lot of stories from him. He invited me out to speak at the University of Kansas. I, I taught at a couple of his workshops. And it was such a joy. I said, well, I got everything. I went to Elmira. I, did, I didn't choose KU. I went to Elmira, and I got the great experience of Elmira of becoming, of learning how to interact with people and becoming a whole person and not being shy anymore. And yet I still got to be, to work with Jim Gunn and to be his editor. So I felt like I had, I had all the advantages. Um, so um, I, as I uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I've done a lot of, I've done a number of anthologies. Most of them were reprint anthologies based on stories we had published in the magazine. But there was a, I was very, very surprised and very um, honored when MIT Press approached me. There was a long, there's a long running anthology series called um, Tomorrow's, I mean, uh, 12 Tomorrow's. And uh, five of them had been published at that time. They'd all been edited by men, very prominent men, who were known for hard science fiction. And hard science fiction just means that science is really the basis of the story. It's very important element. It's not going to be fantasy. It's not going to be. Um, it's probably not going to be faster than light travel and time travel that don't really exist. It's going to really be more based on science that could really be could really happen because uh, purists would say that those other stories might be more fantasy in their own way than the hard science. So it was a real honor to be the first woman asked to do this anthology and um, and I am known for having a preference for hard science although I love all genres. I really do enjoy the weird and the, the fantasy elements and you know but I do love hard science fiction. And so um, I do have a copy of the cover there the next slide the anthology. So this came out. Sadly, it was supposed to have a huge promotion in twenty, in the spring, uh, like July twenty twenty. But we all know what was going on in July twenty twenty. They postponed it to September twenty twenty. But um, it didn't. That wasn't it. Didn't make much of a difference. I did. It was wonderful though because all the stories in this anthology are originals, which means they're not reprinted. They were written for the anthology. I met with the publisher, publishers at MIT, and they wanted a theme for this one. They had never had a theme before, but they wanted this particular one to have a theme. So we worked out the theme together. And I like the concept. I like I came up with the title because, you know, I like the whole title, the concept of physics of entanglement, and you know, the fact that these electrons that aren't are not even at a distance are still related. But I also, and of course, we wanted to explore just all the future of relationships, lovers, families, or friends, just just looking at it from the future. And we had a lot of wonderful writers, including Anna Lee Newitz, uh, Cadwell Turnbull, who had been a student of mine and who um, is, is a, he's um, from the American Virgin Islands and a wonderful author who I published in Asimov's as well. Um, Sha Sha, who is a Chinese author, who was translated for us by Ken Liu, and he's a very distinguished author, author in his own right, but he's a very, very brilliant author. But he also was the translator for the three body problem, which you may have all heard of. Um, so that was very exciting. Um, and you can take down the slide. Um, so that was very rewarding, especially since I hadn't even gone looking. It just came in my lap, and it was a lot of fun. And um, and actually gave me something extra to do during the pandemic. I had all kinds of Zoom publicity, promotion, publicity. And um, but in the meantime, we've still uh, so the magazine, of course, over the years has changed a bit. We were all print. Nobody ever, you know, we didn't have computers. We didn't even have correcting typewriters when I first started. Now, of course, everything is done 
did digitally. Like I've been sending them, we send directly to the printer. Many steps have changed. Now we are also available as a um, digital edition, so you can, we can be subscribed to and downloaded to the Kindle or you know the iPad um, directly from our website. So the but we've kept up with the times. We still charge subscription, but we um. You know, we're still, so we exist both as print and as a digital magazine, uh, which is the way you have to go these days. And uh, uh, still working with incredibly interesting authors. I find new authors all the time. Uh, one of my latest, newest authors is Ray Naylor. I found him in my slush pile, and he's um, he has been getting a lot of recognition. His, his uh, first book is The Mountain and the Sea, and um, he has another one, Tufts of Extinction, just out, and uh, Suzanne Palmer, and uh, just so many wonderful new writers. That we never never at a loss. There's always new surprises coming along, and um, I do think one of the things I have to say, going back to my philosophy degree, is that I learned a lot from John McLaughlin about how to tear apart an argument and how to put one together and how to, you know, how to really assess whether things made sense. And I, that has never failed me in my career in publishing. And people say to me, what should I study to become an editor? And I don't know what to tell them. I can't really say, you know, there, what degree to get, but philosophy never failed me. So I, I would, so I'm not going to recommend that that's, that people follow my path, but it was a great path and it really was starting at Omega and I, I've always appreciated that. And um, Jen, if you want to show the last two slides are the issue that is currently available. It's on the newsstands at Barnes and Noble, and this is the one that's on the Barnes and Noble web newsstand. It's um, the cover story is by an author in India, which is the great thing about the internet. I have stories now submitted to me from all over the world. Um, Arizm two is waiting for a letter, and then uh, my next the issue hasn't come out yet, but this is. Um, uh, this will be our July, August, and due to with the changing times and the cost of paper and the cost of postage, about oh six or seven years ago, we went from monthly to bi-monthly. So we come out, we do a double instead of a single issue, we do twice as many stories, but it's about the same. We and we come out six times a year instead of twelve, but we're still doing fine. And uh, and so we're all, we did that before we launched the digital editions. Um, so we are so that we would save money mailing them out, but it really now doesn't matter because you know they're available as downloads. But anyway, so we're available six times a year uh, at twice the fiction that we used to have in the individual issue. And uh, again, this is a terrific. This issue is filled with stories by great authors as well, um, and that'll be out on the newsstand I think next month. So um, I think that's that's about it, and I'm I'm delighted. Looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. And it's so interesting that you say that you don't know what path specifically got you to an editor, like philosophy major or whatever, and everything just seemed to fall right into place when you needed it to get you where you are now. And I think a lot of us going to Elmira have that same story that it shaped us into something we never thought we could be. I, freshman Sydney never thought she'd be here talking to Sheila Williams on Zoom in front of everybody. So it's just, it's really nice to hear your perspective and just how chance and hard work got you to be an editor of, of amazing things. So thank you so much for your time. And as you know, we did have questions submitted beforehand, so we can start addressing those. Folks listening, if you wanna put some things in the Q&A, feel free and we can address some of those questions. We do have a lot of classmates on the call for you tonight, Sheila, including Jill Adams, 78, who asks what your future plans are. Well, I'm hoping, I hope to keep working as long as I can. And I think, you know, if I ever stop, um, if I if I ever found myself, if I stopped editing, I think I'd probably look into writing. Um, I might do more anthologies or and I might also write I, I think there'd be a lot of, there are a lot of interesting people in the field that aren't that well known. Um, there's a lot of interesting women from the early days in the field. Um, Seal Moore and uh, Lee Brackett, 
people like Lee Brackett, it, her work is really the inspiration for, um, you know, Star Wars. And, um, and in fact, Lucas had to add that to the movie, you know, when it was, <laughs> had to put it in after he had released it, I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm not positive about that. I only get sued. But, but I know that she was, um, um, and uh, so I think that there'd be a lot of room to maybe write some nonfiction about interesting people who aren't as well known, you know, who are well known to me, but maybe aren't as well known to the public. Um, that might be something in the future if I find myself with spare time. But right now, I'm really still enjoying the, the work at the magazine. And it's after 42 years, it's hard to imagine not doing it. So, <laughs> great. Awesome. Uh, Kat Sly Hernandez 12 asks, what advice would you give to a student wanting to get into your field? What would you say are the top three things to focus on? Okay, it's very, it is a very difficult field. I, when I left philosophy, they were sending out notices that there were no jobs in philosophy. And I had no idea that there were even fewer jobs in, certainly in science fiction and publishing. But, so it's a hard field, but there are, um, a lot of people come in through uh, doing publicity and promotion. There are always a lot of openings in those areas. Um, I think uh, one thing to keep in mind for people who love to write is that, well, I do a lot of writing, including the magazine. I do the editorial and I do a lot of interstitial writing. I do the next, the coming attraction, whatever. It's really not a job for writing. You're really reading other people's work and, um, uh, a lot of what you're going to read isn't that, you know, needs a lot of, you. let's put it this way. I get about a thousand submissions a month and I buy six. And I, of, of the thousand, about seven to 800 are real stories. I've been hit a lot with AI, horrible stuff that people are trying to make a buck and sending me, but I can get through those really fast, but they're about two to three hundred. And um, so a lot of entry level work in publishing is like going through what, what is called the slush pile, the, the um, you know, the, the, the looking for publishable work. And there is nothing more exciting and wonderful than finding a new person, but you do have to learn how to just get through everything pretty fast because most of what you look like you look at it's not, I'm not saying it won't be good, but you only have so much room for what you can publish, whether you're in book publishing or short stories. Um, so um, nowadays there are programs you can look into to get, um, there are some short programs, you know, like uh, I think Columbia might offer one. There are some in publishing and, you know, so you can go to what I think, there's one offered in Colorado. The important thing is to make sure that you you make contacts during those. If you take one of those eight week courses or whatever, that you you do everything you can to meet people and, and make contacts during the class courses, so that you might be able to have a contact if you're applying for jobs. Uh, but it there it's it's very hard business you know there's like 500 people for every job opening and the pay is not great you know it's not a, uh unless you get in on the it end or sales um uh, you get into sales or it the often the salaries are a little bit higher higher there or quite a bit higher in some cases so uh, there are many aspects to publishing so it doesn't like my met my, my husband at work and he's a he was a computer programmer so he was doing the programming. So and he loved books. That's why he was in publishing. He could have been anywhere. So uh, so there are many different aspects to publishing. Uh, you have to. It's good to be open to looking at all branches of it, not just being focused on being an editor, which everyone thinks is so glamorous, and it really is fun. But it's very there are so few of them. And, you know, can't stress how few the positions there are. Just gotta be willing to go with what what comes to you, I guess, and go from there. Um, not a question, but Steve Glick says a big hello, and he enjoyed your talk, your talk hosting an LSE dinner Thursday night. Oh, how great. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny you mentioned him. 
And uh, Justin Cates asks, how have you had to adapt to shifts in the publishing industry throughout your career? You kind of hinted at moving to six um, instead of 12 a year, but what other shifts have you had to make? That was very, uh, the biggest thing we were getting criticized mercilessly. We'd already shifted over to desktop publishing, which was a big, and I volunteered to be the very first one to do it before Fiction Magazine, because I like to learn new things and I like to challenges and and I knew I could work closely with the guy who's instituting everything and, and kind of make suggestions so that things would be, he would know what our needs were from my perspective. But um, after that, that happened about between 96 and 98. But we still, the big criticism in the field was that we weren't taking online submissions. We were still getting stacks and stacks of manuscripts. And uh, I, um, but I didn't have anyone who could, we were, we were a small operation and I didn't have anyone who had the time to design an online submission system for me. Um, our IC guys had plenty to do of their own work. And then I met this wonderful person, Neil Clark, and he is um, the editor of another magazine, one of my, my chief rivals, but also one of my best friends. Um, he, he's the editor of Clark's World, which is an online magazine. And he actually offered to design my system for me. So he set, and then he set up all four magazines with the online submission system. So we went overnight from getting um, print stacks and stacks and stacks. You cannot imagine how many stacks, you know, print submissions to all online. There's still stacks and stacks, but you can't see them. <laughs> you can't see us. And, uh, and that was that was life changing, and 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 we had to do it. And you know, it was funny. It was about a year or two after that that I won my first Hugo, and I thought, well, I wasn't going to win it before that. They want people wanted to be, they wanted us to be with the times, even though my stories were all winning top awards. And so, um, so I, I now I so I, all the stories come into me electronically, and uh, I uh, uh, so that was a big change, and then. As I said now, yes, we had to convert because of the print issues to six times a year. But we were, we were very fortunate. Amazon, we were the first, we were the eleventh through fourteenth magazines we picked up by Amazon uh, to uh, for their uh, magazine marketplace, and so they made a big deal out of us. This is going back about. Um, 2010 or so, and they had a whole fiction corner of their magazine page, and our subscriptions took off like crazy, especially Asimov, and I think it might have been the name recognition of Isaac Asimov. So we did very well, a lot of promotion without even trying. Um, this past year, they decided they didn't to get rid of the magazine marketplace and just do the Kindle Unlimited, which was a good kick in the butt we needed to do our own digital subscriptions and I think that's been working out well and uh, so yeah so those are many you know we things I've gone from the beginning where every, doing everything on you know boards and, and then repro and repro you know and crazy you know all by hand to not quite we were not at the <laughs> we didn't set type but you know but all the way through to now it's all done on my computer and, and during the pandemic we learned we could really do everything at home so really now i mostly i go into the office once every two months wow that is a big adjustment probably a lot less daunting too yeah i miss the per i miss the company the people but uh you know it's definitely a lot easier to do it from home <laughs> We did have another live question. Dr. Kelly Kane, Assistant Professor of Social, Social Psychology. Thank you for your, the talk. If you don't mind me asking, do you have an opinion you'd be willing to share on the kerfuffle with the 2023 Hugo Awards and the perceived censorship of authors critical of China? Oh, I so know nothing. Of, I mean, I know about the kerfuffle, but I know nothing really about the facts. You know, I, I think it all seemed crazy to me and um i i really don't know what was going through the minds of the administrators i was very glad that one of the uh, there's an award that analog has given for many many years um the astounding award 
side out as the John Campbell, the, the name was changed a few years ago. And um, one of the parts of the kerfluffle, the one part that could be, you're, an author can only be nominated for the Astounding for two years from the time they published their first story, I think it was in English. And so uh, one of the people who was banned or whatever, didn't end up, who was just disqualified, I guess is the word they were using, was from that, because that award is given with the Hugos, even though it's not a Hugo. So we were able, not me, but the analog, the magazine, we were able to extend, get permission to extend that author's eligibility by one year. So that author is actually on this year's ballot, even though normally they wouldn't have been allowed to, because they were, you know, so this is their third year but because they were disqualified through no fault of their own. Um, and, but yes, I, I think the whole thing was very shocking and I, I don't know a whole lot more than, <laughs> than your professor does, I think. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Faith Lamprey 74 asks, I have been a subscriber to Asimov's science fiction for decades, as was my father before me. Thank you for keeping us engaged throughout all those years. I cried when Azik, Asimov died. What was it like working with him? Oh, you know, Isaac was just so much fun. He would, if he was, he would have cycles during the year. He'd be a little bit down sometimes, but most of the time he was up. And it, I noticed it had to do to a little bit with sunlight. If it was a sunny day, there was a good chance he was going to come in singing Gilbert and Sullivan songs and just come down the hall. <laughs> and he would make up, you know, limericks on the spot for people. And, um, but he also could be very sweet and serious. And, uh, he really, um, I remember once for my birthday, he had my husband and I over to his apartment with his, he and his wife, and and uh, uh, you know, we, and then not long after that, my husband actually got very ill, and he ended up he had a ruptured appendix, and he ended up with peritonitis in the hospital, and I was in, um, just you know kind of in shock. And I got a call, and it was Isaac who said, he would come in every Tuesday, and he said, Sheila, you know, what's up? What's going on with David? And I told him, and he said, I heard this. I heard it in the office, but why didn't I hear about it from you? And I, I thought, I wasn't going to bother Isaac Asimov, you know. It was just so sweet to realize he really was my good friend, you know. And, and uh, the same thing, I remember when the shuttle, uh, the first shuttle disaster blew up, um, I got, I kept, I started getting inundated with phone calls from the press. And I called Isaac. Isaac was one of, before the days of ambulances, but he had an answering service. The answering service thought he was a medical doctor, but they would take, and I, I called him. I said, Isaac, I've got a couple of, you know, this is my dog. <laughs> he said, I've got a couple of, um, of, you know, newspaper, radio stations, TV, whatever, they want to get in touch with you. And he said, Sheila, I've already talked to 28 of them today. And he was broken down. He was so sad. And I said, well, why don't you turn off the answering machine? He said, because then I miss calls from people like you. <laughs> so, you know, it was very rewarding. And I loved him dearly. Um, he was, it was really, he was so funny and so smart. Um, it was great. Uh, um, very creative. And, um, yeah, it was it was it was really an honor. I um, and so the award that was mentioned earlier, yeah, he died in ninety two, and in ninety three I was at, or actually, might have been ninety. So the, um, he died in April ninety two. In the fall of ninety two, I was at a convention, and I was talking to an author named Rick Wilbur, who was also an academic. He wanted to do something to honor, something to honor college students, and I wanted to do something to honor Isaac. And I thought Isaac had gotten his start in science fiction when he was 18 writing for the magazines he wasn't not as a college student but you know writing and i thought that would be a great way to honor isaac would be to found this award which is, was initially called isaac asimov for legal reasons after like 15 years we had to change it to a different name so we decided to name it for the mag dell magazines because they they sponsored the award but um but really it was founded to honor isaac and his memory and uh, and to encourage new writers, and we've we've been published, we've found amazing authors. You know, we get the winner gets expense paid to come to Florida for this conference, but we help the finalists, and and uh, many of our finalists come as well. And 
bosses are always great about meeting them and other editors are scouting them out and uh, so they've been many of them have been published all over science fiction and have done very well so but that was partly that came out of my partly out of my relationship with Isaac too what a great way to honor him um I have a very important personal question what is your dog's name oh my dog's name is Waif and the most of you probably don't know uh because my daughters came up with the name but um the you know if you've seen the movie Howl's Moving Castle by the it was based on a book by Diana Wynne Jones it was made into a Miyazaki movie which is a wonderful movie but in subsequent books set in the same world there's a dog named Waif so both my girls love Diana Wynne Jones's books and so so Waif's name actually comes out of this this dog apparently in the book changes gender depending on the gender of the owner so Juliet had wanted a, a girl dog, but Waif was the sweetest dog. And so we took Waif. And uh, so I said, well, it's, it's in keeping with, you know, Waif can be any gender he wants to be. So um, it was very in keeping. So, so he, and I think Waif was a good name. So he, that's my dog. He's <laughs> like a little lost Waif. You know? We're honored to have him on the call with us. Thank you. <laughs> oh. so, Lori Weller, who I affectionately call Loretta, class of 78, says, Hi, Sheila. Back in October, when I was lucky enough to see you as the keynote speaker of the Quarry Farm Symposium, you talked about AI and how you can always recognize it when it shows up in your slush pile. Can you say a little bit about that? Thanks. Oh, sure. It is so recognizable. I imagine the day might come when it might be harder, but there is really... Partly it's the fact that people doing it don't know anything about writing. So they're not, it, I never get an AI story from someone who is a real, really wants to write, has been trying to write stories and then just gets frustrated and uses AI. As far as I can tell, that hasn't happened. It's all from people who read something that said, here's a way to get rich. You can write us, use this AI program generate this material and these magazines pay money. And then they put all the science fiction magazines on, magazines on and some airline magazines. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and they didn't. So um, they are just, they have no heart. They have no soul. They have no, you have no sense of uh, empathy with your characters. They're all trite. They're, you know, there's nothing original. I said, every human being who ever sat down and tried to tell a story tells a better story than these. It doesn't matter how little education, how little experience in writing, a real person has or had a relationship with a friend, has had a relationship with a parent, has had, you know, can convey that one way or another in a story. And this just is not, it's so wooden and terrible in these AI stories. So, so far that's been my my secret weapon against them. <laughs> I, my, I live in fear that you know, someone will design it that will actually know what they're doing, but not none of my friends are going to help. So, so far, so good. All right. And then two last questions. And I promise I'll let you go. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Kolozinski or Dr. K, Associate Professor of Mathematics, thanks for sharing your story with us. It was great to hear about John McLaughlin. He was a giant of our faculty and he is still missed. Was was there a science fiction class at Elmira while you were a student? I'm curious about your experience. There was one class, um, Randy Minnick, and I cannot remember the other teacher, although he was one of my teachers because we had this weird, our freshman year, we had to take these, this 12 credit, four, we had four professors who were teaching us science, humanities, art, and something and they were all thrown together and it was weird my i didn't go to freshman orientation my first we showed up and he and the guy in charge of us said we're all going to this place on lake seneca and uh and we bonded for two days <laughs> it was so weird but um and that one of the, that professor whose name i can't remember was a science professor um who was one of those four professors but he but Randy Minnick was a chemistry professor. He didn't get tenure, so he left and went into uh, private 
uh, was intended for uh, out in Pittsburgh, and I actually have stayed a little bit, not as much in touch with him, but I did stay in touch with him over the years. Um, I did see him when I was teaching a class in Pittsburgh about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, they offered a course the third semester my freshman year, so of course I took it. And it was on world building, science fiction and world building. And uh, since they were both science professors, they were looking at it from sort of a very scientific angle of, you know, what you would need to know to build to make a believable alien planet that life could live on. So that was the only class I took it, and it was great. And I had a great time, but that was the only class that I know of when I was at Elmira that was science fiction class. I don't think I would have taken it, or I would have taught it if there was anything else, but uh, nothing else that I can that I knew of while I was there. And Randy didn't get tenured, so he was gone after uh, my freshman year too. So that probably kind of uh, put the kibosh on that a little bit too. Uh, and I don't, but I, uh, you know, as I said, I founded the science fiction club. So I got, and Randy used to, they both came to my science fiction club, which was great, both professors. <laughs> so I, I still managed to get science fiction sandwiched in there. You know, when we were doing the newspaper, the guys, there were two guys who were editing it, but they were like, you go and edit. We don't know anything about science fiction. You can go edit this Gene Roddenberry. I was like, oh, <laughs> and, you know, like, Oh, don't make me do that. <laughs> I have to. I almost had an internship with um with um uh Rod Sterling. Rod Sterling. I um he was he agreed to do it. I was going to do it and then he said, you know, my health isn't great. I have to have open heart surgery. Um, maybe next year. And then he went into open heart surgery and he died right after the surgery. So in fact, but I, you know, so that was very, but I had his daughter who had, was a student at Elmira had gotten me in touch with him. And uh, so, so I, you know, I thought those are my closest science fiction experiences at, at Elmira. Um, last question. And it's from Patrick Rocky Carr, who we were just talking about before we started the recording. So his ears must have been ringing. <laughs> Do you see the role of science fiction evolving and shaping our understanding of technology and society in the upcoming decades? That is a great question. I actually was just reading a story today that was looking at the AI. I haven't quite finished it. It was a 100 page story in manuscript and I've got like 10 to go, um, which was really actually a more sympathetic look at coping with AI and how it will, how it could, um, how will we cope if it starts taking jobs, the ordinary jobs, and what will that do to us psychologically and sociologically? And, um, and I thought that was, I think science fiction will always, I mean, many years ago I was at a nebula and the guest speaker was an astronaut. And I've had a few wonderful experiences with talking with astronauts, but the real plea he had was, you know, keep imagining the future for the rest of us because the reason we go into these fields is because we read science fiction. So, and he didn't want it to be all the, he didn't want the dystopia. He wanted us to keep imagining the positive end, which I think is where this story is going that I haven't finished. It's more of a positive look on how it could be, how we can work with it for, in a positive way. And, uh, I think that we're never, so I think science fiction can look at, certainly can look at the effects of global warming and can be, is a great warning of the terrible things that can happen, but it's also can be a positive in that these are ways that we can resolve certain issues. Here are some ideas. And of course it's authors. Sometimes they have a science background, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're just making it all up. But it still might give the budding scientist, the budding engineer, um, ideas uh, for the future. And, you know, I think it's, we're less likely to be affected like Star Trek because we're more and more hard to imagine faster than light travel, but you never know. But still, I want us to, I want science fiction writers to imagine more. What's it like in the inner solar system? What can we do with Mars? What can we do with the moon? You know what, let's, let's keep all these stories going so that we get young people who, who want to do that too, want to go there, want to figure this out. So, um, so I do see, I think I'm hopeful that science fiction will continue to have an impact and a very positive impact. Um, 
you know, that's, that is my hope. And I, I tell writers all the time, readers love positive stories. Writers love tragedy. I think our writers all think they're going to be remembered for their tragic stories. But my readers are always saying, can I have some more positive stories? So I'm always trying to push that angle to some extent. Like saying, I'm not afraid of your sad story, but come on. Don't be lazy. <laughs> it's harder to write that positive story. <laughs> Give it a try. We need that positivity. We get we have enough negativity in real life. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So, well, Sheila, I want to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, just thank you. Thanks, Pat. I appreciate the question. And I wanted to personally thank you for all your time and your wisdom and for spending your Tuesday night with us. I know you're very busy, but um, before we officially end, I know President Lindsay would like to say a few words. Yeah, Sheila, I just wanted to uh, offer my thanks that you spent so much time with us. Very inspiring story. I don't know how you have the focus and the discipline to go from a thousand stories down to six. That <laughs> my hat is off to you. Uh, so and and the incredible people you met along the way. Uh, but I especially liked uh, hearing a bit about John McLaughlin and, and the fact that a philosophy degree served you well in terms of forming an argument and being able to take one apart. So you shared a lot tonight, and it's much appreciated. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sheila. And um, I appreciate everyone's time on this Zoom. Stay tuned for future ones where we get to meet more fascinating alumni. Thank you, everybody.